Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, a lot of times you hear me interviewing lots of amazing guests, but today you get to hear me being interviewed by someone else. Check it out. All right, what is up my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview. And today we are joined, well I should say rejoined by a repeat guest. I think this is probably our fourth, maybe even fifth time that our guest today has been on the podcast. And just to give some quick context before we jump in, our guest here today has been somebody that's been in the industry for almost several decades now. Um, somebody that's had amazing success as an individual agent, then quickly became a, a mega team leader. And I don't remember, and she can correct me on, on the exact stat, um, but built up her team where I believe she was, you know, top four or five in the whole entire country, you know, doing thousands of units on an annual basis. And then has expanded that now into building one of the fastest growing brokerages, nationwide brokerages now throughout the U.S. This has been somebody that's been an amazing friend of mine, an amazing mentor of mine throughout my personal success journeys, had a massive impact on my personal life and business life all aspects of my life. So really stoked and honored to have my good friend, Chantel Ray Finch on the podcast. Welcome back. Oh, thank you so much. Every minute I get to spend with you is such an honor. I love every second and I just adore you and your family so much. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, it means so much. And and all right, so let's just jump on in, you know, because you are, one thing I've always admired about you is your ability to execute and take massive action. Like, okay, we're all talking about something. Like as everybody else is still processing what we're going to be doing, like you're already executing on this thing. Your ability to just go out there and take massive action. Um, and I know that you recently wrote a book about your ability to go out and take massive action, which we will jump in into because you are the delegation queen, man. Like you, I've never seen anybody delegate at such a successful, amazing level and operate with the speed, but you also have precision to that speed that you operate with. All things we're going to break down. Um, but I know the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about in this podcast, because I mean, now that you, I mean, you built s such an amazing, huge business, all different levels of it from again, agent, like we all started to you know, one of the top teams to exist in the planet to, you know, now this amazing real estate company. And one trap that I found myself in, and I know we we're having a side conversation about this before we hit the record button that so many entrepreneurs get themselves into, is you start building this business, you maybe have a purpose for it and you're excited about it, but you you end up building, instead of building this empire, you end up building yourself into this prison. You know, where it's like, now you've got this business you can't stand, you hate it, but you're somebody that's built this highly amazing successful business, while at the same time, build an amazing life where you find joy and passion and purpose through all those things. So with that, like what is the key to building a business that we love versus accidentally building a business that we can, can no longer stand? Yeah. So, and I will tell you this, there has been seasons in my business as well that I literally was like, oh my gosh, I just built a business that I hate. So I, had literally got to a place where I was like, I just, I'm doing way too much. And even though literally, you know me, I delegate everything. And that's why I wrote the book, Delegate Everything But Sex, because everyone literally is like, I've never seen anything like this. Like you, you delegate blow drying your hair. Like that's nuts. I've never seen anyone, you know, I have someone who blow dries my hair like three to four times a week at the house. So, you know, people are like, that's like next level, right? So I have so many next level delegation things that I've done. But even me, I got myself to a place where I was like, I'm just, I'm, I am hating what I'm doing right now. And then I had to like kind of smack myself in the face and go, here's why. Because right now you're doing jobs that you can't stand doing. And so what I tell people is that if you can get to a place where 80% of what you're doing you love, then that's where you are in your sweet spot. And I, I feel like there's all these, you know, leadership podcasts and all these things out there that they are saying, get it to where 100% of everything you're doing, you absolutely love. And I just say, no, that's a crap. That's just a, a bunch of junk. Because I don't care who you are, an NFL player, they are playing, they love football, that's what they love. But guess what? 
there's probably 20% of things that they don't love either. They don't like being away from their family on Thanksgiving or Christmas. There's probably some drills that they're like, we've done this a hundred times. I don't want to do this again. So getting yourself and getting out of that mindset, knowing I'm going to do 20% of things that I may not love, but this is what I talk about. Making sure that those items that you're doing that you don't love, get 80% you love, that 20%, as long as they are really high dollar productive activities. So in my book, I talk about $10, $100, $1,000, and $10,000 an hour activities, okay? And I say, what you cannot do, you cannot become a millionaire doing $10 an hour activities. And I watch so many people over and over, they're doing $10 an hour activities. And I teach you how to stop doing those and you're focusing on $1,000 or $10,000 activities only. And when I say that, People are like, well, it's just a figure, right? Like $10 an activity, you might be paying someone $15 an hour or $20 an hour. You might be paying them $4 an hour in the Philippines, right? It's just kind of a a place where you can figure out like low, medium, high, and really high dollar activities. And that's what you want to do is basically do an audit of your life and and go, I got to delegate all the $10 and $100 activities and keep myself in that $1,000 and $10,000 an hour activities. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting that you brought up the, like with your personal journey of got to the point where it's no longer, you no longer felt joy, started hating it, but then you realized kept doing activities that, you know, and I think that a lot of it, I mean, all of us go through that to some extent. Like there was a point in time where I loved working with buyers, let's just say an example. And then there was a day where I woke up where I was just like, I don't like this anymore. You know, and that novelty and that challenge weighs off, especially for driven people, you know, that's where we start to then loathe those activities. Um, you know, so then looking for, okay, like, how do I need to, you know, what do I, how do I allocate that different focus? Um, how, how do you identify what the 80% is? You know, okay, you, like you talked about the 20%, but how have you identified or those that maybe you coach with and work with, how do you identify what those 80% are, what they love? Because then I'm guessing that that, Maybe not for everybody, but for most, that's always a changing target too when that novelty and challenge weighs off. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, for me, I just go to people and I say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you love doing this? And so if they're like basically a seven or higher, then I go, all right, well, we can keep doing that as long as this is still a a $1,000 or $10,000 activity. And what will happen a lot of times, is it's so funny because some people will say to me, I had a guy who we were talking, he's like, I want to become a millionaire. Tell me how I can do it. And I, I said to him, I said, well, you're not going to become a millionaire doing $10 an hour activities. And then I said, now, let me ask you this. Are you still mowing your lawn? And he's like, yeah, I am. But I'll be honest with you. I kind of like mowing my lawn. He's like, you know, I kind of get out there and, you know, I like it. And I said, well, can you come mow my lawn for free then? And he goes, I don't like it that much. And I said, then you don't like it enough to continue to do it. Does that make sense? So that's what I do because I'm always pushing back on people when they say stuff like that. And in my book, I talk about the villains, right? So there's all kinds of different villains that hold you back from being able to, I call them the delegating villains. And so one of those is, well, I kind of like that. So I should should continue to do that. And so for me, I say, okay, but do you love it enough? There's another villain that's like, I can do it better, right? So that's where people say, well, I know I could delegate that, but I know they're not going to be able to do it as good as me. Or, you know, by the time I teach somebody how to do this, you know, I might as well just do it myself. And Our COO, Heather, who I absolutely love, and she's been with us for probably, what, 16 years or more now. And one of the things that she really would do, because she's so efficient. So I would say, you know, hey, can you do this or that? Can you delegate this to so-and-so and so-and-so? She's like, you know what? I'm just going to do it myself because by the time I teach them how to do it, it'll take me 20 minutes to do it, but it'll only take me five minutes to do it. And I say, ah, ah, ah. I said, Yes, it's going to take you only five minutes now, but you are now going to do this once a week, right? 
So if you now take it, you can do it in five minutes. You get on Zoom, you record yourself doing it. You're doing it anyway, showing him how to do it. Maybe it'll take now 10 minutes, right? Instead of doing five minutes, it might take you 10 minutes because you got to do it a little bit slower and walk through what you're doing. You now have recorded it. We now put it on a site so you never have to teach this again. Now you've taken 10 minutes, but you've saved. Think about how much time you saved because you're never going to do this again and you're never going to teach it again. So it's a matter of, you know, having the, if you know the tools and you know the techniques, and I literally spell it out in the book of exactly what you need to do. You know, I just had a five-star Michelin chef come to my house. A friend of mine was opening up a restaurant. She's like, you know, your kitchen's so big. Can can we use your kitchen instead to have this guy? Because I'm opening a restaurant and I want to see if he's a good chef and, and we're going to hire him. I said, yeah, sure. That'd be great, right? He showed me how to make this steak. And I'm telling you right now, on a scale of one to 10, it was like a million. Like it was so good. But he showed me exactly how to do it. And once he showed me how to do it, I made it for our family. It was probably a 9.5, but still, like it was still an amazing steak. But you have to know exactly the tools. And delegation is the same thing. You have to know how to delegate. It, there's certain people who, when they delegate, there's so many things people get wrong. And then they then they go, forget it. I'm just going to do it myself, Right. And that's what you don't want to do. You don't want to get to the place where you go, screw it. I'm just going to do it myself. So I definitely want to unpack how to delegate correctly. But before we do so, so it sounds like the villains or the fears, the blocks that prohibit people from delegating in the first place. And look, there's not a day that goes by, and I'm sure for you as well, but that I'm not having a conversation, whether it's a you know, a, a high producing agent that's at that point in time, maybe they're popping four or five deals every month like clockwork and they're getting ready for that first hire. You know, um, I mean, that's a common one that I see where then there's so many fears around or there's so many blocks. Um, um, but then those things, if they don't overcome those, it keeps them small. When I say small, keeps them at that capacity. But then the other one that I commonly see is like when you're a team leader or a brokerage owner and they start to needing to put in place their leadership team. You know, like maybe they've, you know, had the ability to start hiring admin, but now they're starting to replace themselves at a higher level and, you know, having other people lead the culture and other like, a, a, you know, more key personnel. You know, so with that, can you kind of, you know, break down what the common villains, aka blocks are that you see in, in how to overcome those? Yeah. You know, I think we all struggle with them. Well, maybe you didn't, but I, I sure as hell did. So one of the things that I will tell you is I, I did a workshop one time and I had everybody and, and I had put in a couple of the people were like multi, multi-millionaires. They were huge. And I put them in, but I, I said to everyone, I said, okay, I'd like everyone to stand for for just a second. And then I said, if you mow your own lawn, go ahead and... um sit down. If you cook your own meals, go ahead and sit down. If you don't have a personal assistant, sit down. I mean, you get where I'm going with this, right? Like all these different things and people would sit down, sit down, sit down. And then the people who were left standing, all of the people who were left standing who didn't do any of these things, their net worth was 10 times what all the rest of the people that were sitting in the room. And I pointed out and I said, look at the network of the people who are standing. The people who are standing delegate all these other things. So the very first mindset that you have to get out of your mind, I call it the cheapskate villain, right? And so what the people do is they go, well, I'm not going to pay someone to do that when I can just do it. Or it, I'm not going to pay someone to do this or that. And what I say is, if whatever your hourly wage is, if you can get someone else to do it for 50% of whatever you're making, sometimes depending a quarter, you know, a quarter of what you're making, you need to delegate that out because you'll be able, you could work one more hour or two more hours or whatever it is, making a little bit more money and being able to do that. But the first mindset you have to get is that visual that I just gave you. 
the people with the highest net worth, 100% are all the people who understand how to delegate and they basically are using leverage and getting other people to do these $10 and $100 activity and they're only doing $1,000 or $10,000 an hour activities or more. Yep, yep. So then, okay, what if somebody, they grasp that and they're like, okay, cool. Like, I get that. I need to do it. Um, but now what's stifling them? You know, because like if we look at, look at the real estate transaction, which, you know, most that are watching and listening to this podcast are tied to the real estate industry. It's like, okay, well, you know the power of that. You're willing to do it. But man, maybe you got this fear of, well, what if they drop the ball on a client? Mm-hmm. You know, like, like how do you overcome that? Because I think, you know, like a lot of us can be control freaks and that giving up control then can be that next block or something that, you know, something that I see quite, quite consistently that people really have, you know, hard part letting go with. So what helps you with that is this. So in my mind, like I, I know that me and you, if we ended up, you know, listing someone's house, we potentially would do a great job, right? Like we know the contracts backwards, forwards, and inside out. I know I'm a great agent. You know, you're a great agent, but here's what holds me back. Because I've got so many things on my plate and I've got so many things to do, a person that could do a better job is someone who all they did was just focus on that. That's why a lot of times people say be a listing agent or just be a buyer's agent because if all you do is listings, you're really going to be good at that and you're really focused. And so my philosophy is if I can get someone to do it 80% as good as me, then that's fantastic. If you're 80% as good, then that's fantastic because I know eventually just doing that over and over and over and over again, you will actually become better than me because you're just doing that. You're completely focused. You don't have a million balls in the air. You don't have all these different things going on and you will end up being even better than me. But as long as they're starting off doing it 80% as good, that's fantastic. Okay, so now we've got somebody that they grasp the mindset you know, right of, okay, I got to have the leverage piece if I want to, you know, maybe they don't want to have, you know, Chantel, you like your net worth, but maybe they're like, yeah, I'd like to still make good income to have a great, you know, like to support my family, but I just want to be able to have a life and enjoy life, you know, because I think even part of your, your like subtitles about being a time millionaire, like you can, you know, like, so what what are their drive is for? It's like, they're like, okay, they they get the mental grasp that, okay, either to make more money and or, or and or to make more time or a combination of both. I got to do this. Um, they're willing to go out there and do it, let go of that control. But I hear all the time, especially from team leaders, broker owners, you know, I, I, all the time of, I just can't find good help. Mm. So you mentioned earlier about like, you, you got to be able to find the right people, hire the right people. Like what is the key or best practices, principles that you abide by to go out there and make sure now you're getting the right people. Yeah. So I talk about whether when you're hiring someone, you want to hire a Tesla, not a bike. And what I mean by that is, so I own a Tesla and I basically, the whole reason why is because there's so many things that that Tesla does that I don't even have to think about. But that's the whole point. Like if you think about a bike, you have to push the pedals. And if you're going uphill, it's really hard and it's not going to know where to go, right? Like a Tesla, I can literally put, take me to Whole Foods and it pretty much takes me there. So when you're hiring someone, when you're hiring someone who's like a Tesla, they aren't going to ask you a million questions. They're going to figure it out. They're going to get you there. The biggest thing is, is when you're hiring, I also call it a beaver or a sloth, you're hiring a beaver, they're hardworking and they're doing great. It is so draining when you're putting, you're giving tasks to people who are a bike. It just doesn't work well. And so the biggest thing is you hired the wrong person. I love this sh- this show. Probably I saw it like 10 years ago. It was a girl named Kendra Baskins Wilkins Wilkinson, and she was a Playboy model and she was had an assistant. She hired an assistant. And it was so funny because she she goes to the assistant and she goes, hey, did you do this? And the assistant goes, oh, man, I forgot. I'm sorry. And then she's like, hey, I was just checking in on this. Like, did you do this? And she goes, oh, man, I totally forgot. And she just snaps. She goes, 
am I your assistant or are you my assistant? She's like, I'm sitting here constantly reminding you of all the things you're not doing. She's like, this is ridiculous. So again, who did she hire? She hired a sloth, right? She needed to hire a beaver. So I kind of go over in the book exactly what you're looking for when you're hiring that right person and some very specific things that you need to do. So for example, one of them is called a three-hour trial. So before we hire anyone, we actually have them do a three-hour trial. And the reason why we do is because we say, before we even, you know, bring you on, we want to see, do you like this? Or, do, do you know, do you like us and all of this? And one girl that we hired, no joke, she was with another company for 20 years. She came in with us and when in the interview, we said, on a scale of one to 10, how good are you on computers? She's like, a 10. And we're like, okay, great. So when she first started, she'd already given two weeks notice to her other job of 20 years. We came and sat down and we go, we said, can you save that to the desktop? The trainer was teaching her. And she goes, where's the desktop? And we're like, oh my gosh, she doesn't, you know, she knew nothing about computers. She was like a zero on a scale of one to 10. And so we quickly realized people say all this stuff all the time, like, oh yeah, I'm great at this or I'm great at that. Well, you don't know until you test them out. So step one, before you even do that is to do a three hour trial. Then we do a three day trial and we have like exact questions you should ask and all of that before you decide whether or not, like one of the things that's a really big red flag is when on their resume, if they're at this place for three months, this place for six months, this place for two months, why do you think you're going to be any different? It's like, it's like a guy, if you're dating someone and he's cheated on this one and cheated on that one, why do you think you're any different? It's like, no, you're not. So again, there's all, we literally lay it out. And we also have checklist upon checklist that you, you get with the book that asks the right questions and has the checklist that you need to be able to delegate properly and to be able to hire the right person. Did you know that you can get all four of the books that I wrote, Waste Away, Fasting to Freedom, One Meal into Tasting, and Freedom from Food? You can buy all four books and get the ebook for free. Go right now to ChantelRayWay.com or you can go to Amazon. Also, I just wrote a brand new book called How to Delegate Everything But Sex. If you are stressed out and are tired of doing everything on your own, go check out Delegate Everything But Sex. And there's all kinds of freebies on the site. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, because like nobody, nobody interviews, like nobody's going to go on an interview like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of lazy. I'm kind of mediocre. I, I show up on time, 50%. Like they all, like people tend to interview great. You know, um, and and I've had to learn that lesson the hard way of test, 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 you know. Um, so let me ask you this of somebody, and this is a challenge I've had because I'm like just, I have a hard time separating, okay, I'm running a business, I need people to perform, and then you develop the relationship, develop the connection, you know, and then cutting them slack. They're like, they're, they eventually find out they're the wrong person, but then- you know, um, so how, how do you how do you handle that? How do you navigate that? Like if they're not performing, you know, like do you give them an opportunity to to like put them on like a performance improvement plan? But then how do you face that? How do you because like every time in my mind, I'm like, dude, I need to let this person go. But then I, oh, I can turn this around. I can, you know, and it ends up being four months mm -hmm. from that initial thought every single time. I've ended up having to get rid of that person, yeah. You know, where I should have just probably just let go immediately. Mm. Yeah, so that's such a good one because the thing is, every single position has to have key performance metrics, right? Like KPIs that say, you know, these are the key performance indicators to see whether or not you're doing a good job. So let's just pretend you had an inside salesperson, right? And you said to them, you've got to set four appointments per day and you have to have a 50% conversion rate. I'm just kind of making this up. But whatever that is, it has to be, okay, we're gonna do that for a week. Every week on Friday, we're gonna see, did you hit your metrics? By we at the end of week one, if you didn't get it, then you would need to say, okay, we're going to 
put you on immediately after week one. You're immediately documenting that. You're putting it on a performance review. And the thing is, is that you have to be able to separate to say like, I I love you as a friend. And so like, that's so important, but we have a business to run. And the only way that this business can be effective is that if every single person has key performance indicators and every person is hitting them. So you could be my mother, you could be my brother. It doesn't matter who you are. The, we What we can do is we can move you to a different position because Again, this might not be the right fit and we want you to love it. And I will tell you this. So like if I was, let's pretend you weren't performing, right? Uh, If you weren't, I would say to you, you want to be in a position where you're hitting your goals every week, right? Like who wants to be in a position where it's like, up, you didn't hit it. Uh, You didn't hit it. No one wants to be in a job there. So I want to do one of two things. I want to either allow you to move to another position where you can be successful or I need to let you fly your wings and fly to another company where you can hit those goals every week. And it, it you you cannot let it go for more than one week. Like it, when I say it's got to be on such a tight, it needs to be like one week, here it is, we're going to give it one more week. And then by that next week, it's you're fired. You see what I'm saying? Like it's got to be really, and everyone needs to understand because either you can do it or you can't. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, it doesn't, if if all these other people, right, if you got 10 other people, now you got to make sure that the performance indicators are right and they're reasonable and people can do it. But if if three other people are able to do it, then there's no reason why this guy can't do it. And you've got to be able to separate where you say, I love you. I care about you so much. I want to, I'm going to pay for two weeks for you to go find somewhere else to work or, you know, whatever you want to do. But you have to be able to rip that Band-Aid off. And it's so painful to the business if you can't do it. So you have to do that self-talk where you say, if I'm a strong leader, I allow people to fly into a position where they can be successful. I'm giving them a gift because everyone wants to be in a position where they can hit the goals and exceed the goals. I don't want you to be in a position where you're not able to hit the goals week after week after week. No one wants to be in a place like that. So then, okay, like certain positions are easier, easy, easier, uh, uh, maybe to come up with those KPIs. You know, um, I've had challenges in the past with certain positions where it's like, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like, a, you know, I don't know, just a front desk receptionist or even like transaction coordinators or, you know, I don't know, a lot of people reach out to me that have a tough time, like when it comes to sales, ISAs, agents, you know, but then like, okay, like maybe they have, I don't know, a video editor or a graphic designer, you know, um, how, how do you, in those kind of more challenging positions, like. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really easy, but that's something that I'm pretty good at doing is coming up with those. So what I would say is like, let's say, let's say a graphic designer, A graphic designer, I would say to them, um, I want you to come up with, let's say they're coming up with memes that they have to do that you want to post on Facebook or social media. You would just say, our expectation is that you do, um, you know, 10, you know, social, uh, 10 graphic designs per week or, um, and then on top of that, some of it's subjective, maybe it's 10 social media posts that attract this much attention, right? Like they have to get a certain amount of likes or a certain amount of, um, you know, shares or some engagement. So almost every position can have KPIs. And a lot, the ones that can't have KPIs, what I say is, do you need that position? You know, it's so funny because I went to the gym um, this morning and there was this front desk girl and she so nasty. Like, I I couldn't believe it. And I was talking to the owner and I said to them, I said, like, think about it. He, I know for a fact he's paying that girl at least $18 an hour to sit at that front desk. She just sits there. Okay. She even has an app that he has where when you log in, she takes the scanner and she just goes like this and scans your, your thing. Why does she need to be there? 
Why in the world would you be paying someone? That gym is open from 5 a.m. till 10 p.m. every single night. They have a front desk person that they're paying every single hour. First of all, they need to get rid of her because she has a bad attitude. But anyway, like that's something that you can automate. Like in my book, I say, there's so before you even delegate anything, figure out how you can automate it. You could, there, there's a couple things that I would suggest that person to do. Don't have anyone at the front desk. Just have the scanner up there and have people scan. If you have one or two people that slide in, who cares? Look how much money you're saving every single hour that that girl's not there. You can have a television up there with someone in the Philippines for $4 an hour that's watching the front desk, that's watching them scan. There's so many different ways that you can do it. But what I say is, okay, before we even delegate it, let's look, can we automate this? Can we simplify the process? Can we eliminate it all together? And then if we can't, now we'll delegate it to someone else. Yep. Yep. Love it. So then, like on the personal side of delegation, you know, something, and this usually happens, like this, I, I can't think of a time I've had this conversation with like, a guy, you know, right? Usually it's, you know, more women that I think, at least in my experience, when I've had a conversation with that, maybe we struggle with this, but like delegation on the personal stuff. Cause I remember like the first time, you know, I flew out, you know, met with you and, and to shadow you and, you know, um, but man, like when it comes to delegation, not just in the business, but also in your personal life. So then that way, like, okay, you weren't wasting time washing like an hour a night washing dishes and cleaning up is like you're you're spending that quality time you know with your kids with your family you know so every aspect of your life is so intentional because none of us are going to get to our deathbed and be like oh i wish i would have vacuumed my floors more i wish i would have cleaned my kitchen more i wish i would have you know cooked more meals you might but you will probably get to the end of your life most people won't say i wish i would have spent more quality time with my kids but you've delegated in such a way where yeah you got your business where you're able to focus on those high key money making activities, but in your personal life, like you're able to invest all your time in the main rocks, you know? Um, but I do talk with people sometimes. They're like, well, I feel like I need to be, or I should be cooking the dinner for my family. I feel like I should be you know, doing these things that are taking hour or hours every night, but it's almost like a guilt thing sometimes, you know? Um, I don't know if you struggle with that or- I don't, I never struggled with it, but I would say, Probably seven out of 10 women that I coach and I mentor would say that to me. They'll say things like, well, I just feel like my mother-in-law, if I delegated that out, she'd be like, what kind of mother are you? And I will tell you, I think I'm an exceptional mother and I spend so much time with my son. But for example, I make him like a charcuterie board every single night because um, he loves that. But he... I deliver the charcuterie board to him, but he doesn't care whether I'm the one who sliced the cucumbers and peeled the carrots and, you know, put all that together. That's all completely prepared for me in the fridge. And then now I'm handing it to him like, Kyle, I've got a charcuterie board for you. And he gives me a hug and thanks, mom, you're the best. So whether I'm the one who physically did all that, he doesn't care. And now because I'm not doing that, we can sit down. We love playing spades together. So we love playing cards. So now we can play cards together. We can, you know, we watch a sermon together every single night and snuggle in bed and do that. We have a couple different shows that we watch every single night. So for me, instead of me doing laundry, because if I was working all day and then at night had to come and do laundry, what is he going to remember? He doesn't, he has no idea if I did the laundry or someone else did the laundry. That's not what being a great mom is. In my opinion, what's being a great mom? That kid, my job, number one, is to grow him spiritually and in his walk with the Lord. He does every single day. He um, memorizes. He has 15 Bible verses, a couple new ones, and then he you know, repeats them. He does 100 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, um, and we do a sermon every day together. So finding out and figuring out Spiritually, what is he, what's going on with him and growing him closer to the Lord? That's the most important thing to me for as my job as a mother. And then just loving him and caring with him and spending time with him and playing cards with him and taking him here, helping him with whatever he needs help with. 
I'm those are all the things that are a great mother. Not me doing his laundry, not me cooking his meal. I don't cook any of his meals. It was so funny. Oh my gosh, I have to tell you this. So our house manager who we've had for so many years, she's incredible. Okay. She's been with us, I don't know, 10 years or more. I mean incredible. But so two days she had off and I was like, you know what? Instead of us going out, I said, I think I'll cook dinner. And so I cooked two meals and I'm not a terrible cook, but I'm not great. And literally, like, I just made a couple things and and they were like, when's Susan coming back, mom? And I'm like, oh, God. Because normally if she's not here, we'll just go out, you know. But I was like, I'm just going to cook this one time, you know. And it was like a disaster. I don't know what I did, but it just did turn out good. But that literally like five, she was gone for like two days. And they were like, when's Susan coming back, mom, Brian, Ann, and Kyle? It was just so funny. So they, they don't love me because I'm great at laundry. They don't love me because I'm a great cook. And so you have to take that mindset out of your head. So then, so it sounds like, like, as I'm kind of listening to that whole picture there of like those seven out of 10 coaching clients that are struggling with this, that you work with, it's like, okay, you're clear on what you want most, what is most, what it means to you to be a good mom. Right. Um, And then from there. Like, look, people are going to judge anyway. No matter what you do, they're going to have that mother-in-law that might judge you for doing this. If you like, they're going to they're going to have some judgment anyway. So you're just, hey, man, I don't care about that judgment. I'm going to do what I feel is best for me to go out there and lead in the way I need to lead. Exactly. Yep. So then, talk to us. I know about one thing that you talk in the book is about the pain lid. Mm. You know, um, and and I say this statement a lot, and and I know most of you don't understand it until you go through it, but growing pains can be much harder than like struggling pains, slow, like slow pains, you know, mm-hmm. like in, in business and whatnot. And the more success that you create, you know, the more problems, the more, you know, pain that can can then can come about. Um, but we'll break down and explain to you, like what the heck is a pain lid? Because most people probably heard, I know that's a kind of term that you coined. Um, and then how do you get beyond it? Yeah. I would say, you know, I knew about leadership pain and I knew that when you're in leadership, it's just a magnet for pain, but I didn't know the extent of how much pain. And I think there's no leadership progress without leadership pain. And what I say is if you're not hurting, you're not leading. And leaders carry pain that most people don't understand. And in order for you to be a strong leader, you have to have that ability to have a lot of pain. And the my favorite example that I give to people is the, the gym. So if I had a gym and I decided it was going good and I was like, oh, it's going great. Let me hire another person to open up a second gym. And I hired him like, you're going to be the CEO of that gym and you're going to run it and everything. And he goes and he does that. And then he decides to quit he takes all the members. He takes all the people underneath him. He starts another gym that's called Your Gym Was ABC Gym, and he names it ABCD Gym, right? And then does everything that you did, took all your ideas, you know, took money. I mean, just anything, you know, think about all those things. What happens is 95% of the people, what they'll do is they'll go, I'm not doing that again. I'm not opening up another gym. I'm just going to stay with one gym. And so if you think about the people who have Gold's Gym or, you know, another gym, Gold's Gym has probably, I don't know, 200 locations, right? Why do they have 200 locations versus, you know, Barry's Gym only has one? It's the leader, the ability for that leader to handle that pain because what probably 1% of the population would do is they'd say, you know what? okay, that other guy took that gym, he screwed it up. It's okay. Just because he did that and just because I had a bad experience doesn't mean that's not going to happen again. I'm willing to do that again and do a second gym and a third gym and a fourth gym. And so that's what the leadership lid is. It's basically you hit your head on this lid. And if you can kind of go and pop your head out of the lid, because every time... It's painful. Every time you hit your head on the lid, it's painful. It's painful. It's painful. And then you just keep pushing through and pushing through. I I always joke. This is my favorite joke. I always tell people, I'm saying, 
leadership is like this. It's like jab, jab, hook, uppercut, right? And what I've done my whole life is literally go, okay, I'm getting punched again. I'm getting punched again. And I just flip my hair back. I turn it around and I smile and I go, okay, here, I'm going to do it again. And that's when you can really grow. It's you subconsciously as a leader, if you can say to yourself, I'm going to have pain one way or another, I might as well have it, you know, to the next level. And I will say this, there's one more thing that it, I did to myself, but I'll give you an example of my friend who uh, has a counseling business. So she said to me, I said, are you going to open up another location? And she's like, no, I'm not. And I said, why not? She's like, well, because, you know, I want to make sure that I have time with my family and I just don't, I want my health to be good and I want this and I want that. And I say, okay. So in her mind, what she has done is she said, if I open up another location, I'm not going to have good health. I'm not going to have time with my family. I'm not going to do this. And I did that with me. Like my goal is to take our company public. Like that's what I want to do. I want to do a publicly traded company. And what I've said in my mind is, well, I probably need to hire another CEO because I don't think I can, you know, I don't want to deal with the pain of going public and all the headaches that I have to do and all of this. And so you have to get rid of that mindset. Think about Think about Jeff Bezos. How big is his company? Do you think that he has more headache or less headache than the girl that owns the counseling company that's just going to do two? Once you get your place to where you can scale, you actually have less, but you have to be able to hit your head on the pain lid and then you can go up. So if in your mind you go, yeah, I'm going to have a little bit of pain, but then I'm going to pop open and then my life is going to be way easier, right? Like think about Jeff Bezos. He's there. He doesn't have a care in the world. He can just say, I'm done. I'm, I don't have it to do anything. I can sit on the beach and do whatever. But think about all the pain he had to go through to get to where he is on the other side. Yeah. Do you think uh, a lot of it is just, you know, a mental perspective about your relationship with pain? Like most people see pain as a negative, they want to avoid it, but you understand that pain and power come from the same place. So you see it as a positive, right? That this is gross, you know? And I always go back to like the Jim Rohn, you know, famous quote of, you know, don't wish for less problems, wish you were a better problem solver. You know, so it's forcing you, okay, the new, you know, that new problem, that's a new pain that forces you to learn more, grow more, be able to solve that, find that solution get to the next level and then that's the next one, you know, but when you have that relationship of this is the growth journey that is necessary, that's going to allow me to grow and expand and the best leader I can be. Well, then it's not looking at pain as a negative. It's almost flipping that to where you now see it as a positive. Yeah. I'll give you a perfect example. I saw someone who was a real estate agent that I knew from another company and I saw them at Home Depot working and they were just like, you know, stacking the shelves. And I was like, hey, how's it going? They're like, well, you know, the real estate market's been tough. And so I got out of real estate and now I'm just stocking shelves here at Home Depot. And I was like, oh, okay. And what I really wanted to say to, to that guy was, okay, probably what happened if we go back and look, you didn't want to do the pain, quote, pain of making calls and doing prospecting and all the things you have to do to be an effective real estate agent. And now, instead of having all the the pros of real estate, right, like all the flexibility and all the other stuff, now you're making way less money and you're having to stock shelves. You're working till, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And if you, like, choose your pain, right? Like, you either are going to do this or you're going to do that. And it's about, yeah, making the decision that, yeah, this is going to be difficult, but I can still push through and be able to to break that pain lid. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. All right. Then I know you kind of talked about this when you were explaining one of the earlier topics, but something also you talk about in your book that, and I want to see if you can kind of unpack it and explain it a little bit more in depth is, you know, your, your automate, simplify, delegate, eliminate approach. Like, like what is, it, what is that and how do you apply that? Yeah, so my perfect example is one time. So for what in our call center, we had a call center and 
for we have one of the largest Geico's around where we live. And so we just hired all these people from Geico. Like they would leave Geico and then they would come over to work with us. Well, someone talked us into getting like Geico's phone system, which was like massive. It was like this huge phone system. It was very complicated. It was so much money. And then we ended up having someone that came in and they were like, we don't need this huge expensive phone system. Like this is costing a fortune every time we have these physical phones. And, you know, now we all, we have every one of our employees, every one of our agents, we have, um, you know, the co-working spaces. So if they want to work from an office, they can for free, but they can work from home. And so we basically made it where here's something that we just simplified. We took this elaborate phone system and instead of having that, we simplified it. Jeff Bezos is another perfect example. If you think about him, what he did was think about every time you go buy something on a website, you got to put in your name, put in your address, put in your credit card, like that's a pain. And what he did is he said, okay, we're losing customers because let's say they're la they're laying in bed and they decide to buy something and they go, crap, my credit card's downstairs. I'm not going to go get it. Never mind. I'm not going to buy it. Or I don't feel like entering all that stuff in right now. Forget it. I'll just buy that later. And then they never buy it. And he goes, let's simplify the process so much so that they can, with one click, go, I want to buy this and, you know, and then check out and they've now bought it. That's why people want to buy from Amazon because they've simplified the process. So it's just a matter of being able to go in with fresh eyes and looking at all your process and go, okay, how can we simplify this? And then not only that, let's eliminate some of this stuff. I'll, I will tell you one thing I was terrible at before. You know, in real estate, you know how it's just ebbs and flows, right? Like in the spring, you got all these contracts and then come, you know, September, or August, you know, things slow down. So what would happen is when things were really busy, our transaction coordinators would be like, I'm slammed. I got too many files. I'm overloaded. So I'd be like, hire another one, hire another one, hire another one. And then I finally wisened up. And then I was like, gosh, now we've got too many people here once things slow down. So what I did was I finally got to a place where before we hire another person, I would say, okay, let's go ahead and figure out what's their list of things that they are going to do. And then let's eliminate. There's things that they're doing. We, we at one point had so many things on our checklist. It's like, no, let's eliminate first a bunch of things that they're doing that we don't have to do before we hire another person, which is really, really important. That was a, a big thing for me that, that I needed to work on even personally. So then just to make sure I'm following along. Okay. So it's before maybe I go hire somebody else. It's okay. What of this process can be automated? What can be simplified? What can be eliminated? So you're going yes. through that process to even see is, hey, is it even necessary to bring on another hire or to delegate this thing out? Exactly. All right. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So is there anything that we didn't talk about when it comes to delegation? Any questions that I should be asking you that I haven't asked you thus far? I think you asked them all. I think, you know, the biggest thing that I would say is like the checklists that I've created and you get them free in the book. And, and the, if you go to delegate everything but sex.com, there's a place where you can get even more checklists. But instead of recreating the wheel, go there and get our checklist. We give a couple of them to you for free. And you can basically, it's so much easier to look at what we have and then change it than trying to whoop it up yourself brand new. I'll give you an example. One time a friend of mine came up with all their goals like they did family goals and spiritual goals and blah, blah, blah. And I got to see all their goals. And then it was just so much easier for me to create mine because it, he had things on there that I hadn't thought about and stuff like that. So I just really suggest people to go there, look at all the checklists, get the checklist and don't try to whoop it up. And I even give contracts like I have a bunch of contracts that I give away to that are really, really important. Like I'll give you I'll give you a big one that I wish I would have done. So like, for example, in any business, if you think about it, kind of what I was talking about before, 
people are going to leave you. And you need to have processes in place where you go, okay, if I give you leads, if I personally hand you leads and you decide to leave, I don't want it to be a big, you know, crap storm when you leave. We just need to make sure we're on the same page. For example, if you take one of the leads that I give you, you give me a 35% referral when you leave or whatever it is that you want to make a 45, whatever you want to make that percentage is. But having all that written out in contracts, and I've learned so many lessons that if you take the contracts that I have and then modify it, you've already learned, you, you don't have to deal with all the crap that I've already had to deal with that I added into the contract, if that makes sense. So I have a ton of real estate contracts, but other contracts that you need for independent contractors, employees, I give them all to you for free. Take that, you can use it and modify it however you want for your business. It will make your life so much easier. Yep, love it. Okay, so delegate everything but sex.com. Yes. That's, all right. So anybody that's watch or listen to this, go check out delegate everything but sex.com. Go snag your copy of the book. For those of you that are maybe driving down the road, um, and you can't go there right now. If you just scroll below show notes, description, wherever you watch, wherever you're listening, I'm gonna have that link right up top. I'll have it also in the pinned comment, top pinned comment on YouTube if you're watching there to make it super easy on you guys. And look, I'll and audiobook. They can get it on audiobook. And I got a lot of flack because people were like, Oh my gosh, Chantel, you wrote a book called Delegate Everything But Sex, but you did the audiobook yourself. And I was like, Yes, I did, and I will tell you why. I said, because I personally believe when when an author reads their own book, there's some passion. I mean, even how you're how I'm talking right now, right? Like I'm very passionate. I kind of talk with my hands and I I I kind of breathe that into the book. And I believe that when an author reads their own book, it's about 10 times better. And so when you can get something 10 times better, you should go ahead and do that yourself. So that's why I did the recording myself. Yeah, no, I love that. And then, and, and what's funny too is, at least, you know, I know this just because we've known each other so long. Like, this isn't a clickbait book title to sell books. Like, I remember one of our first conversations, I don't know, like 15 years ago, you know, I was asking you about, hey, what, what's what's the key to your success? And you, you, you said those exact words, I delegate everything in my life except for sex with my husband. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, and then, and, and, you know, you're not just writing this to, for this, I mean, this is something that you eat the live breathe um and i'm a big believer in if i want to figure something out let me just go out there and figure it out from somebody that's already had success with this that's already created the success before i don't need to go recreate the wheel and i can tell you that well over half my process internal systems have been designed because of chantel yeah right like i, I mean i've always been kind of a system process person but the first time i met you and saw like you're always 10 steps ahead of everybody i've ever met you know, when it comes to all this stuff. So, you know, I highly encourage everybody to go snag the book, snag those resources right now. Um, and again, we'll have those links below. Well, I have one last question for you, Chantel. I know we're going long on time, but um, I haven't had a chance to, and this isn't anything to do with the book. Yeah. Industry right now, all the stuff with all these NAR changes, because this is going to be released. I know we're recording this on the 25th, but I'm going to release this like probably Monday, Tuesday next week. So people will mm -hmm. watch, listen to this, you know, before these mm -hmm. NAR chains are rolled out. But man, a lot of fear, a lot of people freaking out. Um, mm -hmm. But you've got a lot of agents that you manage and, and create a ton of success. You've adapted to a lot of different changes that we've seen in our industry. You know, what are some top tips, recommendations that you have? Mm, yeah. To so, these changes? so one of the things that I think is that everything in life that holds you back are two things. And it's fear and anger. They are the two lids that really push you down. And I'll give you an example. I had a friend of mine who married somebody. Or, I'm sorry, she was engaged to somebody and they ended up splitting up and she ended up not dating anyone for a while. And I said to her, I'm like, why aren't you dating anyone? She's like, I don't know. She started going through all the fears that she had, like, you know, I make a lot of money and I'm afraid people are going to, you know, come after me for my money. And, you know, I still feel angry that, you know, that other relationship didn't work and, and stuff like that. And so my thing is, is that every single thing, if you can get to a place, even having a friend 
kind of talk you through that and go, okay, what's what's going on right now? What is your fear? What are you afraid of? And then what are you angry about right now? Those two things, if you can have somebody, so like with her, I said to her, you know, if you don't have a fishing pole in the water, how are you going to catch any fish, right? And she's like, you know, we, we kind of talked it out and figured out what's going on. But what you need to do is kind of say, okay, I'm not going to have fear around this. There's every time you turn around, like it when when it was 2008, we had a it and the whole recession was there. We had one of our best years. So everything, it doesn't matter what's going on around you. If if you realize that everybody, the the cream always rises to the top. And so you have to think about how do I need to shift? Where do I need to go to be able to be successful? And the first place is right here between your your ears to be able to say, no matter what happens, I'm going to be successful through this. I just have to figure out which way I need to shift to the right or to the left to be able to get there. So I think having someone that you can coach, like, you know, doing coaching with you, like, it's so funny because I just talked to someone. We were just hiring. We were we were hiring somebody, and they had said that they were talking about how amazing your coaching was. And they were like, you know, I almost quit real estate. And they were like, you know, I did coaching with with Josh Smith, and it turned things around like completely. And so, to me, if someone wants to be successful, I don't know a better coach than you in real estate. You are the best. And to me. I would get on board with Josh's coaching because what you have to fix is this and getting into mastermind groups, getting into these groups with other agents and going, okay, what are you doing and how are you doing it? I mean, how we met, how me and you met was some guy, I don't even, I don't even remember his name now. I feel terrible, but I don't remember who he was, but he literally called me, you and like four other people and said, okay, we're all top agents. Let's get on a phone call once a week and let's do a mastermind. And we were like, okay, right? I mean, do you remember that's all I'm saying? And it's like, I cherish that. And I feel bad that I don't remember who that was originally. I don't even know if he's still in business. Do you remember? Yeah, it was uh, Mike Cerrone. Oh my gosh. That's so, and I just talked to him. I love him. I I just couldn't remember who put us together. But yeah, so he put us in that mastermind. And I mean, he's wonderful, you know? So it's like, Get yourself into a group in Mastermind and mastermind what is going to happen and then get yourself into a coaching program. That's for any business. I don't care real estate. I don't care what. Those two pieces, you've got to you've got to fly with some bigger fish for sure. Yep, 100%. And, and I truly appreciate the plug. It means a lot. Um, all right, so we're going to have the link below, delegateeverythingbutsex.com. But also, Chantel, I mean, you've got this amazing, rapidly growing, one of the fastest growing brokerages, virtual brokerages now in the United States. You're on all 50 states. So anybody watching, listening to this, they're thinking about a move, thinking about a switch, thinking about a you know career, and they want to learn more about, because with, when you're with your company, you're also going to be mentored by you, you know, right? All of that stuff and be part of your amazing company. Also, if somebody wants to check that out, where do they go to learn more about? Maybe? Yeah, that's, they would go to joincanzel.com and there's tons of free resources there as well. Like we really live in an abundant mindset. And so we just, we really love to give back. So if you go to join Kanzel and click on free resources, there's so many different things on that page that, you know, there's like, if you want to do a housewarming party or how to get 20 online leads or how to double your business, double your time, how to do Facebook retargeting. I mean, there's just so many different things on that site that you'll really be able to grow. And we, every week, um, we get different guests um, every Tuesday and pe- we allow people to come on for free. You've come on there, amazing guests from all over. Once a week, we just bring great people from real estate on and we just do a free Zoom call and we love to be able to get people to join that as well. Yep, awesome. And, and in case you guys are driving, whatever, can Zell, so join can C A N Zell Z E L L. So like can sell, but can't sell. So Z E L L dot com. But I'll have links below as well where you guys can click and check that out. And as always, Chantel, not busy you are, 
truly honored to have you here. It's always amazing having you on and being able to catch up with you. Thank you so much. Love you so much. Yeah, love you too. And those watching, listen, we truly appreciate you. Truly appreciate you being here. Go snag that book right now, and we will see you next time. Peace. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 